Welcome, everybody, and uh, hope that this is being beneficial to you. What I want to do tonight <clears throat> is um, start right on the attributes of God. We've spoken uh, quite a bit about the essence of God, and that's talking about what God is, and that there are three persons in the great Godhead that the essence of God is made up of three persons, and three persons are the essence of God. You cannot separate them. They're without beginning or ending. And the best way for us to try to understand the one God in three persons, or three persons in one God, is to look at the attributes of God. And I sent out this afternoon, and I think everybody's probably got it, they thought to check their email, uh, with scriptures for each one of the attributes of God that we're thinking about. We won't get to them all tonight. And if you haven't had a chance to read those scriptures, uh, you can do that through the week. But the first one I want to deal with <clears throat> is the omnipresence of God. And if you have those scriptures there, you might take note of them. But nevertheless, you'll have them uh, to look at after the class is over. When we talk about the omnipresence of God, of course, omni is from the Latin, means all. Um, we're speaking about the immensity of God and also his infinity. And, of course, the word infinity could be applied to God's attributes in general. In other words, uh, his omni omnipotence is infinite, and his omniscience is infinite. I think British call that omniscience, but we pronounce it omniscience. So these terms state the fact that God is unlimited, in relationship to space. Remember, space is created by God. So he transcends space, time, and material things. So God is everywhere. There, in other words, is not a place where God is not. He is in a particular place with each person, and at the same moment, he is at all points of the vast universe. As you may say, he inhabits the universe. Now, I know those things, being finite human beings, restricted by time and space, is hard for us to grasp. Again, you notice I pointed out there that the fact of the matter, we can get the fact of the matter that God is unlimited in relationship to space and time, he transcends it. So it's not a part of God that is in each place, but all of God that is in each place. We can say it this way, <clears throat> in whatever manner God's essence is present anywhere, it's present everywhere. So we come to Jeremiah chapter 23 in verse 24 in that list I gave you. Do not I fill heaven and earth? So we're not just speaking about time and space and material things, but that's true of all of heaven and uh, what he created there. So the fullness of God fills the entire universe. Everywhere God is, there is all of God, and all of God is everywhere. Now, do I fathom that? Do I understand that fully? No, but I can accept the fact. That we need to understand that as he is in every place and with everything, <clears throat> he's uh, independent of every place and everything. No place limits or contains him. His presence is with his creation, 
but his presence is not a part of his creation because God is not created. So omnipresence means that God is with all that he has made, but he's not a part of anything that he has made. And that's why we shouldn't think of him as a man. He's not even identified with, with any place. Uh, I'll pause here and say this. Uh, place is one of those words we use a whole lot, but try to define it. So when we say place, what do we mean? Well, if we say place from the standpoint of time, space, material things, then uh, we know that God is identified with those things, but uh, he's not identified with any certain place. That is, he's in all those things, but he's, he's not uh, identified with any one place. You know, when God uh, had the Israelites build a temple, Solomon built it. It was clear that this temple can't hold me. The Israelites had made some mistakes in their thinking. They thought, well, here's the temple. God dwells here, and that's where he is. But they had, if they thought that way, they had the wrong concept of the um, omnipresence and omniscience and all the other attributes of God. So God is above space, yet he's in all space without being localized at any specific point. He's just as much on the moon as he is right here with us or in the farther stretches of the universe as much as he is here or in heaven. So to be everywhere does not mean that he's to be equated with anything that exists. Now, pantheism, Pantheism is a contradiction of the biblical teaching because God is distinct from his creation even while being with all of his creation. Pantheism says he is uh, as much in a leaf as he is in a tree, as he is in a blade of grass, and so on. So that's what pantheism is. So that's why we're separating the false belief of pantheism about God's existence from God himself, the true and the living God, we can say. So his essence, the one true and living God, is not impacted by his presence being at any point or all points anywhere in the universe or anywhere in the cosmos. So all this discussion really what it comes down to speaks of God in spatial terminology. Now, I, I bring this up at the end of this particular attribute because we tend to think that way because we're made that way, at least while our spirits are in our physical bodies in time and space and the material thing that we are. So we're limited by the language we have to try to understand God, and even our thought processes are limited. And you'll hear me say that over and over again, as I've already said it in other classes. God was omnipresent before there was space, before there was a, I would say, a, a point or a, a place or anywhere. God's essence existed as being. That's why he says, I am that I am. So to speak of and really to attempt to comprehend God using spatial language when his omnipresence is non-spatial is to cause the thought process to lose, its, lose itself. And I have found in the study of these things over the years that my thought process kind of butts its head against the wall sometimes because it just can't comprehend and there are no words that I have that can fully express God. So it is to realize uh, that God is greater than man. And that's the best thing I can say because men all too often think of God as a human, and if anything more than that, a superhuman like Superman. But when we understand the things I'm talking about, 
at least in the acceptance of the fact of his attributes, then the thing it should do to every one of us is cause us to be in awe at the measure of that difference between the great I am and us. And I think when you read again, do I not fill heaven and earth, said God. Jeremiah 23 and verse 24. That says a lot when you think about it. Well, if you have any questions, be sure and jot them down about these things and also the scriptures that I gave you that covers each one of them. But uh, I'd like to move on from his omnipresence to his eternality. You should have scriptures on that too. Uh, we usually say he had no beginning and he will have no end. Well, again, my mind can't wrap itself around that. I can accept the fact of it, but to understand what it is not to have a beginning and not to have an ending. And add it to what we just finished, his omniscience, he inhabits the universe, is just too big for me. So God was before time, and he'll be after time. He created time. And he can work within time, but he's not limited by time because time does not affect him. He does not grow old. Uh, he's never been young. He's timeless, thus eternal. And uh, think about that. There's no succession of moments with God. You ever tell somebody, give me a moment? That doesn't fit God. Um, if you try to think for a while and even use the language that we have at our command, you'll find it very difficult to talk about eternal things without using language that's geared to moments and to time. The past uh, and the future don't have any meaning with God. Now, let me pause here and say this. When God created time, space, material things, of course, all the material creation was for the benefit of man. And once in the creation, he got the world ready, then he created man to live in it. He did not put man in the world too early. The world was ready to take care of man's needs as God created him when God created man. So he works with man because man is at this time in the flesh uh, controlled in the sense by time, space, such things. So God Though he can work with us, he's revealed his will to us on our level of understanding, and he made us to understand, and he doesn't bypass the way we comprehend and we learn and we understand as he communicates with us. But in doing that, he's not influenced by time. He's timeless. He's eternal. And the past and the future, again, you can see how that would have no bearing on God. It's past and future to us, but not to him. That really is all bound up in Peter's statement about God, that a day is with the Lord is a thousand years now of use a day. That's the way the ancients would have had of saying uh, he's not governed by time. Time started with his own will of it for it to start, and it runs the way that it does by his will, and he'll end it someday. So he doesn't remember as we remember. Now, you say, well, I find those words in the Bible. Concerning God and man, those are accommodative words. God has spoken to us so we can understand. And God is so high and beyond us, he has to speak on our level. I don't, we really ought not think that to be a strange thing. Because we try to talk on little children's level. We don't expect them to understand some things. That's one reason, the main reason, I suppose, that we have um, the different grades in which children are in. 
if you're teaching a kindergartner, you don't teach him necessarily like a, being ordinary people, ordinary IQ, or as far as that's concerned, you don't teach him at a fifth grade level. You don't teach your first grader at a fifth grade level because they have, they have to mature and grow. So here we are, created in the most uh, intelligent one of mankind. Still doesn't begin to measure up God. So God still has to speak to us so that we can understand him. So you'll find times that the Bible will say that God remembered this or whatever, but that's for our benefit. It never was out of God's mind or he wouldn't be on uh, omniscient. So he doesn't remember the past. Uh, he doesn't anticipate the future. He already, he's not in the future. He just is. Thus, when we come to the scheme of redemption set out in the words of the Bible, all scripture given of inspiration of God, and what it does, 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17, all God is doing is revealing. It's called revelation. Is revealing what was already there with us, but because we're anchored in time and space and the way God created man, then there, ha then, then there has to be, as it is, uh, over the years, thousands of years, the gradual revelation of how God would save man. And notice, that gives even more meaning to Paul's statement in Galatians, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. Well, we shouldn't think of that as God being uh, controlled by time. We should realize what he's saying is that in man's development in time and space, as a material being and who man is, then there was a particular point in time that it was right for Jesus to come into the world. That's all that's saying, because he's working with man as he made him and working with him where he put him and how we're governed today and always have been. And thus we can talk about at the end of time and the judgment day. Have you ever wondered uh, how it is that when Christ returns, every eye shall see him? How is that possible? Because if I look up in the sky today, what I see up there is not what somebody's seeing in Australia or China. And yet every eye will see him. So there's going to, have to be some change of things from the normal process of the way everything works when Christ comes back. Well, that doesn't bother me because he is able to do those things. So God doesn't conceptualize. That's a good word, I think, to use here. His existence in the way that man does. And why is that? What we've been saying. Time is inconsequential to God. So Genesis 21 in verse 33, he alone is the everlasting God. The everlasting God. This is what was developing when God began to deal with man more and more. And when he appeared to Moses in the burning bush. Because when he says, I am that I am, Exodus 3.14, by his own name, he's affirming his eternity. So God's not to be spoken of as a uh, in past tense or in future tense, but always in the present tense. Uh, he is not was. Uh, he is not will be. But and. Maybe that's a good way to put it, but that's what it amounts to. That's what he's telling Moses, I am. So he's eternally present. And that's why Jesus said, while he was in the flesh, his earthly ministry, before Abraham was, I am, John 8, 58. And as we've said before in Revelation 1, 8, he is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. 
So all that exists, matter, space, and time, and all that's in metaphysical things, the spiritual, is because of him. Because he existed before all things and made all things. So only he is infinite, unaffected by matter, space, and time. So eternal, that is the word eternal, speaks of God's relationship to time. And omnipresent speaks of God's relationship to space. We'll talk about that more when we get to that point. So both time and space are creations of God. I keep repeating a lot of this because I want, it's so hard for us to not think in terms of space and so forth, time, material thing. But God transcends each of these, time and space. Neither one of them impact God in any way. So he inhabits all space and he inhabits all time. And thus, I say again, he unfolded his will. It was already in mind because he knows all this, the object of knowledge. There's nothing that's knowable that's outside of God's mind. But in his essence, he is conditioned by none, none of them. They have no bearing on him. But we're bound by both while we're in the flesh. And even when we leave the flesh, we must realize we'll still be created beings, though glorified in a resurrected body. We still will be created beings. We're not eternal. That's true. We can reach immortality, but we won't die again. But we always will have had a beginning. God's the Father of our spirits, writer of Hebrews tells us. Thus, when um, a baby's conceived, the parents have conceived its flesh, God conceived the spirit. So, Man's bound by both, and he cannot even comprehend reality without space and time. Try it sometime. Try to comprehend reality without space and time. You can't do it because we're always dealing. That, that's what we talk about truth as far as empirical truth is concerned, truth that can be experienced through the five senses of man. That's reality. The very nature of water in its liquid form, means you're not going to walk on it. But Jesus in the fleshly body walked on it. Because he, his spirit was the second person of God. He had the divine spirit. So God thinks in terms of, uh, we think in terms of location and succession. We can't do otherwise. And that shows you, if you think about it, what it really means, how limited we are. That's why we call ourselves finite, but God infinite. It means we're pretty frail when it comes right down to it. Though men sometimes think they're the greatest thing that ever was. That's why they tend to think of God as a man. So time's not eternal. Somebody said there was a time when there was no time. And you notice to express that, we have to use a limited vocabulary. So time had a beginning. Time must have had a beginning, or eternal time in the sense of time without beginning, I cannot conceive of, and I don't think anybody can. But notice how limited we are with the words we use to try to express eternal things. So if time has um, as its origin in God's creative act, then time has no effect on God. Now, again, think about what Peter said. And the reason for that is, is that God is the creator and controller of time. He's not a prisoner of time. He's not subject to the changes caused by time. As I said a while ago, that's because time is inconsequential to God, even though he works according to the laws of time, day, night, weeks, year, because that's where man is. And the whole thing about salvation pertains to man, and that has to get to where he is. He's past, present, and future, the eternal I 
am. Genesis 1 1 really talks about, means that. I should put it that way. Um, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That means God has prior existence. But it existed before anything else existed. All that is, that is, uh, we can say it. it came after him. He was before all things, and by him all things consist. Not only are spirit and matter distinct, but spirit was before matter, the creator before the creation, uh, God before man. Before time, it was God. Again, Genesis 1 1. Before the angels, there was God. Before there was anything, there was God. God, who alone was in eternity past. He doesn't need anything from us. He's self sufficient, for lack of a better way to put it. And he brought him into existence, time, space, the angels, matter, man, anything created. So to reject this is to really uh, lift something or someone to the same level as God. And that's just not something that's compatible with uh, the Christian faith, as the Bible teaches it, and faith because they hear hearing the word of God. Psalm 17. You know, this is one reason that uh, God said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. He wants it impressed upon man if there is nothing before him. God is self sufficient. So, because God's duration is eternal, notice I didn't use time or anything pertaining to time, then his promises are eternal. They're not here today and gone tomorrow. His promises endure. They remain. We can say that his promises last as long as God lasts. Now, how long is that? Well, you can't even use the word long with it. He's the great I am. He never began, he never ends. He always is the I am. So you have in Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth will pass away. But my words will by no means pass away, to put it in our way of saying it. And as Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 40 in verse 8, the word of our God stands forever. God and his word really cannot be separated. And when we talk about the infallibility and the finality and the completeness of the Bible, the Word of God, we're not saying it is God. But because of what God is, then His Word stands sure. And they both continue. And what He says is... Um, rooted or anchored in who he is. Now think about that for a moment as to the words of Christ, the words of the New Testament, and the promises he made to the faithful. It should be a great comfort to the believer, to the faithful child of God, the faithful member of the church. And that's important because we live in a world that's ever-changing. Bad things and all sorts of things. A world where people make promises and they don't keep them or they're broken, forgotten, whatever. A world where really words are cheap as well as many people, lives are cheap. But with abiding I would say confidence, strong confidence. The believer, the faithful child of the living God, the Christian, can embrace the promises of God for what reason? Because the one who spoke them is the eternal am. For this is God. 
our God forever and ever. The sentiments expressed in Psalm 48, verse 14. It's interesting uh, to note again Psalm 90 and verse 2. I think this one is in your list, Psalm 90, verse 2. Even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Thou art the one divine essence without beginning or ending. Thou art the one who's above man and not limited by time and space, which he created. That cannot be touched by things that are terrible to us or important to us while we're in time and space, the material body. Again, let me remind you, uh, as you're studying with us here, that you might want to write down any questions you have about this or um, about the list, about the uh, scriptures that I sent you. Now let's turn to this other attribute. And again, uh, you should have all the scriptures on this. God is omnipotent. Omnipotent, all powerful. And no creative person, as uh, far as I know, any existing thing can harm God or remove God. And nothing against him will stand. His power supreme. Remember, Jesus said to he said to be sitting at the right hand of the power. Mark 14, 62, the power. So God's omnipotence focuses upon his ability to accomplish his eternal purpose. And remember, Paul tells us in Ephesians that the church was in the eternal purpose of God. And his will cannot be thwarted, ultimately and finally. Now, as we live day by day here and we try to do what God told us to do, then sometimes that's thwarted. But the ultimate in God's will is what he intends for the faithful and what he intends for the unfaithful, the place prepared for each one of them and where they're going to go at the judgment, even the judgment day itself how he will destroy this world. None of that can be thwarted. And thus, we don't want to be found, as it were, to fight against God. Because it won't work. Think about Jesus speaking to Saul of Tarsus when he was the great persecutor of the church. It's hard for thee to kick against the tree. Against the goad. When they used to drive oxen, they would have a long pole on it with a sharp hook on it. And they gouge those uh, oxen to make them go. Well, sometimes when they gouged them in the back of the hill, you kick back at it. When you did, he'd kick the thing and hurt himself even more. And that was the idea Jesus had. Look, my will's going to be done. Ultimately and finally, nobody can stop. So it's hard, Saul, for you to kick against the goal. So he's never bound. He's not restrained. He performs uh, all his pleasure. We'll use that terminology for we're limited. And when he acts, power's not diminished. Good example of it is one I use all the time. Genesis 1, verse 3. God said, let there be light. What happened? And there was light. There was light. And I think I've mentioned before that the Hebrew actually says light be, light was. Now, I don't understand that kind of power because he spoke that out of absolutely nothing. So repeatedly in the first chapter of Genesis, God spoke expressing his will. And you see that in the creative power of God as far as uh, material things are concerned. It came to pass for God is able to cause it to come. 
I hope all of this has caused you to realize even more and more why God says several times concerning the atheist, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. What he wills, he does. Why? Because he's able. The question is asked, uh, is anything too hard for the Lord? Genesis 18, verse 14. Jeremiah 32, verse 28. And the answer is that God, with God, nothing is impossible. Now, somebody says, but the Bible says God cannot lie. That's impossible for God to lie. Well, why is that the case? Anybody ever ask? Because God's essence, what God actually is, is true. We can't lie. That's said really on our understanding of things. Now, that doesn't mean he's doing right now all he could do or that he could have done things a different way. That's not the point. It's like saying, well, why did he create man in the first place? Well, a lot of good it does to ask that question because here we are. That's a moot point. Notice uh, Jesus, uh, uh, or rather John pointed this out in his preaching. And that is that he could from stone raise up children of Abraham, Matthew 3, 9. But he didn't, did he? That's always amazing. That means he could take the DNA of a stone and redo it and have a Jew. He didn't send 12 legions of angels to assist, to, um, to assist uh, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, Matthew 26, 53. But he could have, but he didn't. There is the possible with God, and this is a big point to remember. There is the possible with God, and there is the actual with God. In fact, God is able to do more than he actually does. Now, remember, we want to drop back on that the things that are revealed belonging to us and our children forever. But what about the things that aren't revealed? They belong to God. The secret things belong to God. Omnipotence then is consistent with wisdom. That's a very important point. We as mere humans have the power to do a lot of things that we don't do. Because we're at least wise at a certain point. So because of the exercise of God's power is always consistent with deity, with the essence of his being. It never deviates. Does that help us understand a little better why the second person of the Godhead, who is God, in the flesh, will always keep his mind and keep his human heart, if you want to call it that, in complete harmony with God. I do always those things that please him. So God's power is not exercised in a, a, a manner contrary to his holiness, his righteousness, his love, So, in the exercising of his omnipotence, it's constant with his divine essence. Let, let me say that again. The exercise of God's power, that's his omnipotence, is constant with the very essence of his being and all that that means. You know, God never wastes anything. Think about that for a minute. We, we make, uh, you go out here and build a house. And you can be the best carpenter there, there was. You're going to have waste. I don't know anything that we do as a mere human being that we don't have waste. But God doesn't. Think about this for a minute. Why did Jesus spend the time that he did on the cross? Why didn't he stay there three hours? 
Why? The best answer I can give to that is, is that he was satisfying God's justice. And when he had satisfied, he didn't need to stay long. And to stay less would not have satisfied. Thus, what does he say when he wills himself to die? It is finished. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And you know, when you look at him on the cross, we're about to draw near the end here in our class. When you look at him on the cross, have you ever noticed that there's no indication at all from what is revealed about him on the cross, what he said, that, that he was ever halfway conscious? He was fully cognizant of everything he did. And one of the most excruciating and painful and horrible deaths that man never figured out to cause another person to die. And, you know, over and over he said, no man takes my life. I lay it down. So he suffered to the uttermost. What does that mean? The exact amount of time it would take to satisfy the one divine essence justice. And when he had done that, he died. By his own will, he died. Nobody took it of it. Took it, took it from him. He laid down his life and shed his blood. He, his blood wasn't forced from him. He willingly shed his blood. Now, remember, life's in the blood. So when he shed his blood, he gave his life. So what's the true um, Exercise of omnipotence. What is true of the exercise of omnipotence is true of each of the attributes of God. For the exercise by God of any of his attributes never violates his divine essence or what God really is. So God does not deny himself. Remember what John said about Jesus? He cannot deny himself. No act of God is inconsistent with God being God. That is, uh, no act of God contradicts God. There's no contradiction in God. So God's power is the assurance that his purpose will be fulfilled. He will not be turned aside from his plan. All he wills will take place. Thus, through Isaiah, God speaks basically Surely, as I have thought, so it shall come to pass. And as I have purposed, so it shall stand. Chapter 14 of Isaiah and verse 24. There are a couple of questions. I don't know where I have time to get into these. Uh, J.D. can give me the signal when to quit. But uh, we'll introduce them. So we're out of time. Okay, we'll just stop here. and We'll begin here next week concerning God's omnipotence, and I'll, I'll approach these two questions, and uh, they'll serve the introduce the lesson next week and further expand upon what we can understand, hopefully, of the omnipotence of God.